Hey, how's it going? My name is Lieutenant Tyler Fisher, call sign Buffer. Um, with VAQ 129, the Vikings out of Whidbey Island, Washington. Uh, I'm also on the Growler Air Show team. Uh, we're here in beautiful Tyler, Texas uh, at the Rose City Air Fest. Uh, and I'm gonna give you a nice walk around of the EA-18G. Uh, so step in here behind me. Uh, we'll start with the most uh, important thing because uh, this is a Navy aircraft, we do land on aircraft carriers. Uh, you can see up front we got this massive bulky landing gear. Uh, two large tires uh, and then a couple uh, systems here on the left and right, which I'll talk to you here in a minute, uh, of how we uh, launch uh, off an aircraft carrier. Up front we've got uh, the AOA indexers, uh, so this is going to keep uh, the It'll let the LSOs, the landing signal officers, uh, that are on the back of the boat, uh, to let the uh, pilot know that they're on speed. The middle one is gonna be this orange light here. That is on speed, so the pilot's on speed. The upper will be green. That's gonna let the uh, LSOs know that the jet is slow. And then uh, red is going to let the LSOs know that the jet is fast. Right here, this big thing here is our uh, launch bar. Uh, so on the boat, when we're taxiing around uh, here on the field and at, on the boat, uh, this is going to be up. And then at the boat, uh, we'll have uh, taxi directors taxi you up into the catapult and they will give you a signal to drop your launch bar. Uh, up in the cockpit, a switch for it on the left-hand side, the pilot's going to go ahead and drop that. And you'll see the launch bar come down. And then after that, they will taxi you forward into the shuttle. Uh, and then at that point, after they taxi you forward, we'll come back here towards the aft end of the landing gear. Uh, the nose wheel gear. This is our hold back fitting here. Uh, so the hold back fitting will attach, attach this big, it uh, looks kind of like a hot dog, <laughs> but they will attach that to the ship and then to this actual hold back fitting here. Uh, once that's completed, they'll go ahead and taxi you forward. Uh, and this now is the tension that's holding the uh, 40,000 pounds of thrust when we go up to burner uh, power. That's going to hold this jet uh, back from going forward. And then uh, pilots will run through a series of checks before uh, they're ready to launch. Uh, and then in the daytime, they'll give the hand salute to the shooter. At that point, he will check all the final checkers. And then after that, thumbs up. Uh, and he'll point forward on the flight deck. And then you'll have a uh, catapult launcher go ahead and press the launch button. Uh, and it's as simple as a button being pressed. And then off to the races, 180 miles an hour uh, in about 150 feet. It's a pretty awesome ride. Uh, would love to take everyone out on it. That's my favorite part about naval aviation is the catapult shot. More stuff on the landing gear. Uh, obviously, uh, we've got our landing taxi light, just like you see any general aviation uh, airplane have uh, sitting there. So easy switch in the cockpit, turns that on and off. Steering mechanism, uh, we've got a hydraulic system on board. Uh, primarily, a uh, nose wheel steering is going to steer this jet around. We have two modes of that. We've got high gain and low gain. So taxiing around at an airfield, you can be in low gain, easy day, taxi around. Uh, if you need to make a sharp turn, easy click of a switch on the, uh, on the actual uh, stick uh, in the front seat, and it'll get you into high gain, and you'll get uh, a large caster uh, in order to swing the jet around uh, and then primarily we'll use nose wheel uh, high on the aircraft carrier uh, because we are taxiing in confined spaces uh, and try not to hit other jets. Moving forward uh, on the growler here, obviously these are the doors so they're uh, when the landing gear is down uh, they're going to be open like they are now uh, and then once we are airborne uh, and clean the jet up these doors uh, will run through the appropriate uh, process of closing uh, just so the jet is completely covered up. Uh, moving forward here, this is our chaff dispenser safety switch. Uh, so you'll only see this thing out if we're actually carrying items. Uh, and items would be chaff and flare, uh, uh, which is more of a defense mechanism for air-to-air -air and surface-to-air stuff uh, that, that we use in combat uh, and also training. Uh, but if this jet did have flares on it, uh, they this would be out and that's just a safety mechanism. So there would be no misfires uh, while the jet's parked here. Uh, sweet. Other things on here. We've got canopy control uh, here to open while you're sitting 
uh, on deck. It's just an easy switch up or down. It'll open and close it. Uh, and then this is also the ladder deployment, uh, which is controlled electrically. You can also do it manually, uh, which I will uh, show you here in a little bit when we do the walk around. Uh, but yeah, if I were to push that button now, the ladder, which is stowed up under here, the Lex, uh, would just drop down electrically. In here is just a compartment. We've got some circuit breaker, circuit breakers uh, and some of our, our weapon systems, uh, which will be un unable to open for you guys today. Uh, but here, uh, it probably looks familiar to most general aviation uh, enthusiasts. Uh, it's a pitot tube. Uh, we've got two on board, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, so we do have some redundancy with that. And they can uh, handle up to very high speeds. Uh, I believe the Super Horn is rated to about 1,200 miles an hour, 1 1.8 Mach. Uh, so these are pretty strong uh, pitot tubes here. Uh, this vein over here, this is going to be our AOA indexer. Uh, so AOA is uh, our crucial uh, uh, way of flying uh, when we land. Uh, unlike uh, most general aviation uh, people are uh, kind of based on air speeds, uh, the, anytime landing at the boat we're flying in AOA. So that's an angle of attack uh, and we'll kind of talk about that more when we go around to the back of the, uh, the growler uh, and we look at the tail hook and why angle of attack is very important. Um, so, uh, also when fighting this jet uh, in the air-to-air -air arena, it is awesome uh, with its fly-by-wire system. It's awesome in the high uh, AOA or high alpha uh, arena. So it's very good at slow speed dogfighting, uh, and that's kind of uh, kind of a, a realm and a regime that you you like to be in, uh, depending on who you're fighting and who you're training with. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the flight control surfaces as we get around to that. Uh, but you can see this thing has a pretty big throw uh, and that's basically uh, going to be acting as a wing uh, and giving us AOA feedback uh, in the cockpit of like what AOA we're actually flying at. 514, that's just the side number of this jet. Uh, all the jets are, are tied with a Buno number uh, that we have in the fleet. Uh, so this is just the side number of the jet, 514. This uh, line right here is going to be the f formation lights. Uh, so at nighttime, they'll uh, appear as green and that will help the pilots uh, maintain formation uh, at nighttime, which is challenging. Uh, and it's also challenging making joins at nighttime. Usually we just take things a little slow. Moving forward up here is the radome. So hidden behind this thing is the APG-79. That's going to be our AESA radar that we use uh, primarily for air to air and air to ground. Uh, it's also, you can use it as a weather radar, uh, depending how, how, how familiar you are with it. But uh, awesome radar. It's the, the newest one on the, on the fleet for the United States Navy. Uh, the Super Hornets, uh, Rhinos, Fox, Foxtrots, and Echoes. Uh, I'll use this, uh, and that's the latest and greatest. I won't talk much about this radar. There's a lot of a lot of cool information uh, that if one day someone's lucky enough to fly it, you'll you'll learn about it. Uh, but that's kind of all I'll talk about with the radar. But that hides behind this big radome here. Towards the front of the aircraft, uh, as we talked about, this is a big radome here. It's one of my favorite views, uh, just kind of looking down the nose of the aircraft. You can see uh, how, how big this aircraft actually is standing up next to it, uh, which I was unaware uh, until I came up to Whidbey Island and learned how to fly this, uh, how big this airplane actually is uh, and just how well it performs for the, for the size of it. So one of my favorite views standing, looking down the front of the airplane. Uh, moving forward. Same stuff on the other side. Like I said, we have redundancy, uh, another AOA indexer here, uh, another pitot tube uh, back on the right hand side. Uh, again, another formation strip uh, for nighttime flying with the side number. For aerial, sorry, not aerial refueling, ground refueling. This is our ground uh, refueling door. Looks similar to uh, pretty much any other jet aircraft on the line. Uh, they're just going to hook up the hose here uh, and then they will uh, fill the jet up there. If you can notice above uh, the side number 514, you'll see a door. Sorry, I can't reach all the way up there. A door, that's going to be our refueling probe. Uh, so big mission uh, that seems pretty benign uh, because we put on different hats when we go out and fly. It's like we're launching off the boat. Sweet, we're off the boat. Where are we going? We're going to, you know, uh, whatever mission we have to 
to go complete. Sweet, in between there, we don't have enough gas to get there. So, sweet, you got to put on your tanking hat and go meet a tanker uh, and go through that process, which uh, starting out, learning how to tank is, is very uh, nerve wracking. So once you've got a bunch of tanking experience under your belt, it's more, uh, more comfortable to go do that. But uh, inside the cockpit, we have a switch uh, that will uh, open and close the, uh, uh, the aerial refueling door. Uh, and you'll see a probe come out. It'll look like kind of like an arm lifting out. Uh, and it's just a probe that sits on the front of the jet. We've got some airspeed limits for it. So big thing is opening and closing it less than 300 knots. Uh, and then once it's uh, out and retracted, we're up to 400 knots uh, is kind of the limit there. Uh, most of our tanking evolutions that we do uh, are off similar platforms. The Rhino, uh, the, the F-18, they have refueling capabilities and that's gonna be kind of organically to the boat uh, that we will tank off them. They'll provide us with gas. Uh, and then also Air Force assets. Navy tanking is different than, than Air Force tanking. Uh, and that's saying that the, the Air Force guys have a boom operator who actually drives the uh, refueling probe into the, the jet itself. Uh, the Navy is different. We've got a probe that comes out uh, and we have to make contact with, uh, with the basket, uh, whatever, whatever airplane we are, uh, we are tanking off. Uh, again here, this is just another uh, uh, door that's going to close uh, once the landing gear uh, is retracted. Moving forward here, you can see this big, uh, I call it a sunshade right now. Uh, this is gonna be our Lex. Uh, and the Lex, uh, as I talked to earlier, uh, is also uh, another piece of this aircraft that's gonna give us uh, that kind of high alpha, high AOA capabilities. Uh, it does provide lift. Uh, and it does disturb wi uh, the, the wind over the wings, uh, which can help out uh, our big vertical and horizontal stabs that we'll get to here in a little bit. Uh, that'll, that'll help you give you some good pitch authority when you're in the high alpha arena. Uh, inside uh, these doors here, again, it's just gonna be all circuit breakers uh, and uh, lots of computers uh, that help kind of drive all of our, our equipment on board, uh, which we won't be able to open up to today. Uh, this here is going to be our uh, ECS scoop. Uh, so if for some reason we were to lose, uh, you know, some bleed air uh, while we're flying around, which cools uh, all these systems that are running in the jet, uh, there's a switch in the cockpit. We call this the beer can, uh, and this will pop out. And essentially, it's just an air scoop uh, that will just take ram air in and try and cool systems. Um, so it's just really a, an emergency piece that, that this jet has. Uh, and again, we call that the beer can. Uh, same thing on this side, uh, not a whole lot uh, that we haven't talked to about the landing gear. You can see we've got these big hold down fittings uh, and these are, these are really for, uh, uh, for the aircraft carrier. Uh, depending on how fast the boat's moving, wind over deck, uh, you can see winds up to 60, 70 miles an hour on the aircraft carrier. Uh, and we've got a lot of tie down points uh, just to keep these jets secure on the flight deck. Moving forward, uh, I think a lot of people uh, misinterpret this as a bomb. Uh, this is actually an external fuel tank. Uh, FPU-12 uh, is the, the, the name of it. Uh, but this is an uh, external fuel tank. Holds about 480 gallons, uh, which is about 3,200 pounds of fuel. Uh, and this just helps for, for getting us a little further uh, when we're out on the road uh, and a little bit extra gas to kind of work with there. These here can be mounted uh, pretty much on any of our hard points, uh, but most likely a growler configuration. Uh, you'll see a centerline tank like we have here, and this is kind of our, uh, our like fighter configuration when we're training for that. Uh, but then sometimes uh, when we're training for our AA uh, stuff, we've got uh, AP, sorry, ALQ-99 pods, which we don't have on the jet, but most likely you'll see this external fuel tank um, on a hard point that would be here, which just looks like this. It's just our brew. That's what's going to hold our fuel tanks and uh, ALQ-99 pods. Uh, but here you can see that's where this brew 32 would, would attach, and you could also see a fuel tank uh, mounted here. Uh, so a lot of options, a lot of different configurations. Uh, like I said, our, our uh, F-18s that we tank off around the boat, um, sometimes their configuration is a five wet. So they will have five of these fuel tanks uh, going across 
uh, the whole jet. Um, and that they're kind of pushing their limits uh, of kind of their max weight uh, for takeoff, which is uh, for the Growler, it's 66,000 pounds, uh, which is pretty heavy. Uh, most configurations we fly in is usually around a 56,000 pound jet. Uh, when we're kind of battle grizzlied out, uh, and that's that's kind of our normal configuration. Uh, and then while I'm talking about battle grizz, we usually refer to that as three ALQ 99 pods. So we don't have any on the jet today to show you, but uh, if you go on on Google or watch any other videos, you'll see uh, just a big kind of looks like a boat with a big rat on the front. Uh, and that rat on the front, once we take off. Uh, over a certain speed, it'll kick the system online, uh, and that rat is literally just going to power that pod. Uh, so we're, we're usually flying around with three of those, uh, and that's our primary mission for electronic attack. Uh, two drop tanks, uh, so these FPU-12s that you see here, and then either uh, some variant of a HARM or ARGUM, which is our air-to-surface missile. And then uh, up here under the cheek station, uh, we can carry AIM-120s. Uh, which is our air-to-air -air, uh, missile there that we use for the for all our air-to-air -air, uh, mission sets. Behind here, this this big red thing, this is just our intake cover, uh, keep all the birds and critters from going in there. Uh, but behind there uh, is a long intake. It's probably about 12-ish feet uh, into until you hit the first uh, first stage of of turbine blades. Uh, and sitting behind here uh, is a general general electric. Uh, F14 400 uh, turbofan. It's an awesome motor. Uh, each of those at military power. So you might hear uh, uh, people in the military called military power as essentially the equivalent of a civilian max power. Uh, we don't say it, call it max because we have afterburner. So our max is afterburner. Uh, so at military power, which is going to be full power, not an afterburner, they put out about 14,000 pounds of thrust each motor. Uh, and then once we stage afterburner, uh, up to about 22,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, and then obviously that's going to vary on, on altitude, uh, but they, uh, they're pretty powerful motors. Uh, but just realize this is a big airplane. Like I said, we normally operate in that 50,000-ish that uh, 50,000 uh, pound range, uh, and if you kind of do the math, you know, 20,000 times two, that's 40,000. So we don't have that one-to-one -one thrust ratio like, like most fighters do, uh, but that's why this, this jet does fight well in the, the high AOA uh, environment, uh, just because of its size uh, and, uh, and its capabilities. Earlier we talked about the nose wheel uh, component. Uh, here's one of our main landing gears. This is our right main landing gear. Again, another hard tie down point, uh, which is crucial, like I said, on the boat. Uh, and then we've got these uh, massive shock absorbers here. So when we're doing a pre-flight, uh, my technique is I just, as long as I've got about three fingers uh, of exposure here, that's, that's good enough for me. Down here, this is going to be our planning link, uh, and that's just going to keep uh, essentially these wheels stabilized so they're moving forward down, down the runway when you're taking off and landing. And then you can see here, we've got these big, big tires. Uh, unlike you see in most general aviation uh, or even Air Force planes, uh, these are just this size just because they're, they're making a pretty, pretty hard impact on landing around the boat. Uh, when doing a pre-flight inspection, uh, one thing we're also looking for is the brake plug. Uh, so down here on the back side uh, i'll kind of put my finger on it probably get a little dirty but you're looking for uh just some exposure here uh, and that's just showing the the wear of the brake uh, so we're usually looking at that on a pre-flight uh, and then again uh, more pre-flight stuff just overall integrity making sure everything's attached and look good um, underneath here you see a couple of these uh, removed before flight standard stuff for for airplanes we've got 10 that we have on board uh, four of them are going to be in the cockpit and then the other six will be out uh, under the landing gear, hook, nose wheel, uh, and then the wings. Um, and then, yep, underneath here we can, I'll come around here and kind of talk about some of the stuff under the wheel well. <coughs> so, so under the wheel, wheel well here, uh, so this is our APU handle. Um, so our APU is what's going to start this jet. Uh, most civilian uh, jet aircraft do have an APU on, on board. Uh, but for, for our jet, we need to have it charged to 3,000 PSI. Uh, so there's this gauge here uh, that 
that's where you check it on pre-flight. Cool, 3,000 PSI, uh, you know your APU is gonna start. Uh, for some reason you show up and you see a thousand uh, then you're kind of in for a workout at that point uh, and that's uh, that's where you're gonna remove this this handle here go ahead and pop it off so you remove this handle uh, and then you'll come up underneath here you'll stick it in here uh, you'll put the pin in and then you're just gonna start pumping it uh, I've done it a few times. There's a couple techniques. Best way is to have a, a partner with you and be on the other side and you kind of go back and forth. Uh, and it could take a good 20 minutes uh, of just doing that. So if you're out in the heat, uh, it's, it's not a fun time. So that's one thing when I go on the road, first thing I check when I get to the jet is how's the APU? Uh, and that's gonna determine whether I'm gonna start sweating or not for, uh, for the rest of the day kind of pretty much all the stuff like pre-flight stuff like I said it's just general making sure everything is intact uh, we've got a hide circuit breaker up here that uh, that'll pop uh, so if you get under the jet and you see that popped out then uh, you know jets probably down got to work that uh, as I talk to the APUs what's gonna start the jet so 3,000 pounds is what you need uh, and here's the exhaust right here uh, it's gonna blow out uh, once you fire up the APU uh, battery power alone will fire up the APU. It's got enough power uh, to get that thing turning. And then once you got the APU online, uh, then you'll go ahead and uh, cross bleed the APU air that the little, it's basically a little jet motor inside. Uh, it's gonna produce a bunch of air. Uh, you'll go ahead and dump that air into these general electric, electric motors and they'll start cranking. Uh, and then we've got an awesome fuel control system that kind of starts, uh, it's really just kind of automatic. So uh, as we talked to earlier with the chaff and flare uh, little safety switch uh, that was out up front. Uh, underneath here uh, we can hold up to two, two buckets here uh, and then another one up here. These both can hold 30 a piece uh, and that can be combinations of chaff and flare or all flares. Uh, we've got different variants uh, that I won't go into that we use for combat and then we've got uh, you know we'll, we'll train with training flares just so you can get the, the visuals. So like we were talking earlier, uh, again, we could have another uh, a Brew 32 here, uh, which is an older hard point, just like you see over here uh, on this station. Uh, like I said, normally uh, what we're carrying on these stations is just gonna be those ALQ-99 jamming pods, uh, which is what we use for our primary mission of jamming enemy threats. Uh, and, and usually that's what we're gonna carry on, on these stations. Uh, and then again, we do have the capability to put external fuel tanks uh, like we had here. Uh, in the center line, station six. Um, on the outside over here, uh, this is another a brew that, uh, that you can again hold another ALQ99 pod uh, if you wanted to have a whole lot of drag. Uh, and then we'll also normally see, uh, which I think we have on the other side, a LOW, uh, which is, that's gonna be our, our launching rack. Uh, so that's where we would carry our uh, HARM or ARGUM, which is our uh, surf uh, air to ground missile that we carry. Uh, the Harm is a high-speed anti-radiation missile, uh, and that's a pretty cool weapon, uh, and that's kind of helps with our suppression of enemy air defenses uh, when we're out on the battlefield. Over top here, you can see here, it's our leading edge flap, uh, which uh, see most airliners have them. Uh, but like I said, it's a fly-by-wire system. Uh, so I wish I could get in the jet now, hooked up to hides and do a wipeout for you. And you can see how all these flight control surfaces, they kind of work together. Uh, and that's for pitch, roll, uh, kind of any access uh, that you want the jet to fly. They'll all work together uh, to help get the jet uh, to that piece of sky that, that you kind of want to do. So uh, really easy aircraft to fly uh, just with this awesome fly-by-wire system. Uh, and you can see when we're, when we're super alpha up in that high alpha regime these leading edge flaps will come down uh, and you'll see you'll see them just taking a big bite out of the sky and that's just what's gonna let us fly in that high alpha arena uh, which is pretty cool to see uh, when you're kind of flying it with the stick and looking out and watching the wing actually like do uh, kind of match what your what your hands doing in the cockpit uh, coming up over here uh, on top those are our ALQ 218 pods 
Uh, so again, our primary mission is electronic attack. Uh, so in order to uh, kind of suppress the, the enemies out there, we have to be able to see them. Uh, so that's kind of our eyes in the sky. Uh, and uh, essentially that is our receiver for, for our entire system. Um, so that's what's going to kind of locate geographically uh, where our systems are uh, and that's just going to help us see our jamming in, into the right uh, piece of sky uh, so we can help out the strike package or whatever mission we're doing. Uh, sometimes people kind of refer to them uh, as flotation devices, I've heard that, uh, as well as hot dogs, so uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, but those are, those are kind of the, the eyes in the sky uh, for this aircraft, uh, and it's a pretty uh, insane piece of engineering and equipment, uh, just how, how awesome those things actually, actually work. That's a nav light uh, up there, so standard navigation light. Uh, under the 218 you can see there uh, and then we've got another one sitting here uh, which is just uh, standard uh, aviation stuff uh, again another remove for flight so this is gonna prevent the wings from moving so as you can see here how they are uh, they're folded right now um, and this is usually how you'll see them on the carrier uh, flight deck uh, this big motor here is what's gonna uh, go ahead and move those wings out uh, and up it's uh, pretty gnarly to, to actually see it in person. Uh, it's kind of cool looking uh, when we're moving those. But again, this is uh, just to minimize space on the flight deck because uh, uh, not sure if anyone's been on a flight deck. It is a, a small area to house a whole bunch of airplanes. All right, as you can see, as the wings folded, uh, this big guy right here is, a, is our aileron, uh, which as you can see is a massive, uh, if you kind of look at the ratio of the wing, it's a massive control surface. Uh, so that's just going to give us those awesome roll rates. Um, and they're also going to act uh, as flaps as well when we're, we're kind of in that high alpha arena. Uh, the, once this wing folds, uh, it'll fold out uh, and then it'll just be a flush wing across. And then here we've got our flap system. So like I said, once uh, these will primarily act as ailerons, uh, and then depending on airspeed and, and uh, how fast or slow you're flying, these will also kind of act as a, as a flap uh, as well, uh, which will kind of match uh, the, the control surface, um, especially in the, the takeoff uh, and landing configuration. As you can see, these flaps, uh, again, a huge control surface, again, aiding to that, uh, that awesome high alpha arena uh, that, that this jet can perform at. So huge control surface, uh, and you can see this thing will make big swings up and down, and that's really just to bite down and give us more lift. We can drop our flaps uh, under 250 knots. Uh, they won't schedule in two, until 240. Uh, and then they also have a redundancy system. If you were to take off and bring the gear up and leave the flap switch down, once you get through uh, 250 knots, it will go into, into a normal flight mode uh, and you'll just get a little caution that'll remind you to put your flaps up. Uh, I've yet to do that, uh, but I'm sure it's been done and that's why this jet uh, is engineered that way. Cool. We already talked about underneath uh, the wheel well. Uh, again, here's another form light. Uh, so at nighttime, helping the pilots fly formation. Again, it'll just be green like the one that uh, we have up on the front of the jet. And then looking up at this massive stab, uh, you see in the middle, we have uh, the uh, formation light. So again, a green light uh, to help in for, for uh, helps for night formation. Uh, and then a massive, uh, vertical stabilizer stabilizer uh, and you can see we've got two on board here uh, and that's just going to give you extra uh, rudder authority um, and believe it or not rudder authority in this jet is also a pitch attitude uh, vice yaw attitude so you'll see when we take the the catapult you'll see the uh the vertical stabs, uh, we call it toe-in. So these vertical stabs, uh, this one here that's hanging out, you'll see them both go in, uh, and that's gonna go ahead and help give you uh, a pitch attitude. Uh, and they kind of act as drag when you're off the, the catapult, uh, and that'll get your, your nose attitude coming up, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, they're all in this fly-by-wire system. Uh, so we are horizontal stabs, you can see here. Uh, it's probably like a king-size bed up at the top, so massive, uh, massive here. And we've got two of them on both sides. Uh, these things, uh, you, you'll see them uh, on deck when we're running through our, our I-bits, our FCS I-bits. We'll run, run a full systems test, and uh, you'll see all the, 
the surfaces moving back and forth uh, and these things take massive swings so again like taxiing on the flight deck or, or when we're starting up the jet uh, it's a huge safety uh, thing to not touch the stick uh, because if someone's running it underneath here uh, you could you could honestly probably kill somebody uh, with the amount of force that these things uh, through the through our hydraulic system sweet the back of the growler we've got our uh, our nozzles here um, so this is obviously the hottest part uh, on the aircraft this is where all of the jet exhaust comes out from those general electric motors we've got two of them um, and these are going to use uh, oil pressure so uh, I can't really show you now because the jet's not on but they're going to have oil pressure uh, that kind of builds up uh, and the nozzles you'll see expand and uh, uh, extract uh, and that's just going to be based on what power setting you're at uh, and that's uh, the, the capabilities of that is just to give you, you more thrust uh, or less thrust uh, if you're in you know have the throttles at idle. Uh, at nighttime, it's really cool, especially on the boat, to see uh, once you're in full afterburner, you'll have a, about, I don't know, maybe 15 foot flame that shoots out of both of these. Uh, I've, uh, I've had a maintainer uh, shooter take me up on the flight deck and I've actually been able to sit underneath these, uh, maybe about 10 feet in full afterburner, uh, and it is a pretty gnarly feeling. Uh, so that, that was a cool experience, uh, but it is cool to see, especially at night. Uh, this guy right here, uh, most important piece of naval aviation, uh, that is the tail hook. So this is what is going to actually stop this uh, 48,000 pound jet uh, when it lands on the aircraft carrier. As you can see, it's got uh, a tail hook here. So uh, when we are at the boat, uh, landing on the boat, uh, one of our before landing checks uh, and then our landing checks is we're gonna have the hook down around the boat. Uh, so the hook will be down. And then as I talked to earlier, we fly AOA around the boat, not airspeed. So AOA, we're gonna fly at 8.1 degrees, uh, which is uh, essentially going to set our hook to ramp. Uh, and that is, uh, you want to keep that constant. Uh, so the goal with that AOA of how it's set and how the engineers had it designed is that as soon as the main landing gears that you have up front touch down, this hook point should be touching the deck. Uh, so it's all three points touching at the same time. Uh, so like I said, it's very important to fly AOA. So if you find yourself uh, slow, most likely your AOA is gonna be higher. And what that means is essentially, uh, here's your mains, here's your hook. If you're flying slow or a higher AOA, then you're gonna drop your hook point. Uh, so you can see where if you got some kind of wave off, uh, the jet could fly away, but your hook is now dropped, so you can still catch a wire, which is, uh, I've seen it before, it's called an in-flight engagement, um, and it's just uh, wh where you don't wanna be in. Uh, so AOA is what we fly. Um, we do have a new uh, flight control system that's been online for, for quite some time, but uh, it is now kind of full redundant, um, and that's kind of, uh, maybe people have heard it as uh, magic carpet, uh, but uh, we call it PLM, so precision landing mode, um, and that has had made landing at the boat uh, a lot easier. Um, I was probably one of the last uh, deployments of manual ball flying. Uh, we call manual ball flying, where you're just setting a trim and you're using uh, the the throttles uh, and the stick kind of manually. We now have uh, precision landing modes uh, that now kind of just get rid of all that. Uh, the jet stays on speed a lot easier. We have insanely uh, awesome wave off capabilities uh, and it just makes landing at the boat uh, a lot easier. Uh, so awesome, awesome systems that the, that the engineers came up with. Uh, and that's, that's really probably one of the, in my opinion, uh, all the weapon systems that we have on board. Uh, I think that update to this jet uh, is probably the best update that this jet has ever seen. Again, like, it, like I said earlier, it's, uh, it's basically a big computer. So kind of like new cars nowadays, when there's an update, um, they could just essentially go in and plug a computer into it uh, and you've got new update to you know whatever, whatever the jet is. So uh, this jet's always uh, advancing and getting better. Uh, which is pretty awesome capability. Uh, and even when it comes to, to the flight control systems uh, that you can just plug a computer in and, and you know, give it some new update, uh, some, new, some new flight envelope that it can fly in. Uh, but yep, the tail hook uh, is pretty, pretty awesome uh, piece of equipment. Uh, and it's actually like pretty insane that, that this piece of steel here can stop a 48,000 pound jet going from you know, 150 miles an hour to zero in about 75 feet.
Uh, there are uh, sometimes at the boat, um, the hook may not uh, catch the wire. Sometimes when it hits, uh, we'll call it a hook skip and it'll hit the flight deck. Uh, and it just depends on how it hit. Sometimes it'll just kind of kick up a little bit. It does have hydraulic pressure, that uh, snubber pressure that uh, essentially keeps it from blowing up. Uh, but sometimes it just hits the flight deck a little too hard and it'll hop over some wires and you go flying. So every time we touch down uh, on the boat, we're always going to military power and that's whether you're stopping uh, or not stopping. Um, and then there's also what we call as a bolter. Uh, so there are three wire and four wire ships. Uh, and uh, if you go past all of them, uh, then we call that a bolter, uh, which, which is most pilots uh, take it to heart. Uh, but that's just all about naval aviation, so uh, cool. Sometimes you'll also see, uh, it's so so precise, you see so many landings that um, you'll see sometimes the the tip of the, the hook point here will literally just hit the top of a wire and skip over it. Um, so you see so many of these, uh, every landing's different, uh, every pilot flies differently. Um, so it's fun being out on the flight deck and, and kind of grading these these guys and, uh, you know, having, having uh, skippers of squadrons kind of, you know, I'm debriefing, you know, an 05, uh, a commander in the Navy uh, on, you know, their, their bad pass that they have. So I think my second best uh, favorite view is just kind of sitting back uh, and look at these massive uh, exhausts uh, on the growler. Come around here again, uh, similar, everything same on the other side. Uh, and then uh, nothing too different under the wheel well uh, on the, the port side landing gear. Uh, again, there's just a hydraulic circuit breaker that we're kind of looking at um, and then just overall general uh, integrity, making sure nothing's dangling. Um, and then again under here we have a bunch of hide servicing ports that our maintainers are going to use. You can see here it's dripping a little bit of fuel, it's totally normal. Uh, that's just a fuel vent uh, when we're, uh, when we put too much uh, gas in the, in the aircraft. Uh, while we're talking about gas, uh, we talked about the external fuel tank. We've got four internal fuel tanks, um, and we're going to have one through four, uh, and they're kind of lined up one, two, three, four. Uh, the the out external fuel tanks are uh, they're going to feed the feed tanks and the two so the two tanks that sit in the the inside of, uh, of the two in uh, sorry the two tanks uh, on the inside so tanks two and three uh, those are going to feed the motors themselves uh, so everything basically ends up going into those tanks two and three uh, at the end of the day and we'll, usually we'll we'll drain the external fuel tank first before uh, before going into the internals. Uh, and while we're talking about fuel, fuel's basically uh, our biggest weight issue. So the, uh, the Super Hornet is, is uh, rated for seven and a half Gs, uh, but when we are uh, over a certain weight, uh, the aircraft will G limit itself. Uh, so in this configuration, um, if we still have fuel in our external fuel tank, sometimes you'll see a G limit uh, of like six and a half to, to seven, depending on the, on the weight of the aircraft. Uh, and that's just going to preserve uh, the the weight versus G uh, and just the load that 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 weight uh, is putting on these wings. Um, so it's all, it's pretty cool. Uh, the pilot doesn't have to uh, do any more aft stick to to have less G. The the jet will calculate it itself. So I can bury the stick in my lap, uh, and the the computer will just limit the jet to six and a half Gs, which is pretty cool. Here uh, is different than our, our brew. This is our Lao. So again, this is where uh, uh, this is our, our missile launching rack. Um, so this is what this looks like, um, vice compared to the brew uh, that you that you guys saw on the other side of the jet. Cool. Everything's pretty much the same here. Landing gear. Uh, again, pre-flight, we're looking for the, the little plug there for the, the brake indicator. Um, for the ladder, I'll go ahead and drop that for you guys now. You just go ahead and reach up and grab that lever. And then it's just going to come down. Cool. Next thing you're going to do is go ahead and put it in this little side ladder. And that's how you drop the ladder. To put the ladder up.
a bunch of release points you got to pull on. Uh, the biggest one that usually gets forgotten is the one right here in the uh, in the ladder. Sweet. And that's how you sew it. Uh, one of the biggest pains is if you're on the road, uh, there's no way of dropping the ladder uh, and securing it. Uh, so we always need a line, someone on the line to come out and drop our ladder uh, so we can get out of the jet. Uh, or else you're jumping off about eight feet there uh, in a bunch of flight gear, so. Yeah, opening the canopy is just easy as that. Alrighty, welcome to the inside of the Super Hornet. Um, see how much you can see here. Uh, but we'll kind of go over some of the switches. Uh, we won't really go over all of them. A lot of them we don't really use. Some of them, some of them are platform specific. Uh, but kind of coming back here, uh, this is our OBOX. So that's our oxygen uh, system there. That gives us 100% oxygen uh, when we're up at high altitudes. Helps us. Uh, uh, breathe better there, but yeah, basically it's got a master switch you throw on uh, and then whenever the actual You put your mask on you'll go ahead and turn the flow on and then you'll get the the nice cool cool air there uh, Kind of moving over uh, forward here is kind of our all of our intercom system um, This is our, our Vox. So this is when you kind of set this to uh, To the right setting. So when you talk in the microphone um, you the whoever you're flying with in the backseat can hear you if you have it up too high, then it kind of acts as a hot mic, uh, which I guess is fine if you're flying by yourself, but it's pretty annoying uh, for, for whoever you're flying with just to listen to you breathe uh, up front. Uh, this is an ICS knob, so that's an intercom system uh, which we use to talk uh, front seat to back seat. Uh, and then a couple other comm knobs there that I won't really go into. Rudder trim. Uh, so this jet's pretty awesome. Fly by wire. It'll, it'll basically trim itself. Uh, but if you're ever in some configuration um, or certain mis mission sets, uh, you might need to trim the rudder uh, just to keep the jet straight and level uh, if you're if you're trying to make uh, some kind of weird turn or something so we do have rudder trim and then this button on top uh, when we're when we start the jet up uh, you go ahead and mash that and it'll set the jet to take off trim um, so big thing there is it sets uh, uh, the horizontal stabs uh, around the field when you're taking off there uh, it'll set it to four degrees nose up and then at the boat will go uh, depending configuration uh, but this configuration specifically will be seven degrees nose up uh, is where they'll be uh, underneath here we've got some fuel uh, switches um, that kind of you can it manages the the external fuel tank so uh, if you're having some issues you can override and try and force fuel out of them uh, or if you don't want to get any gas uh, when you're doing a refuel a hot refuel you can turn them off uh, and that'll prevent fuel from going into them uh, sweet here are the throttles here we've got two throttles uh, obviously right motor left motor we call this uh, the right motor engine number two uh, and the left motor uh, engine number one Normal startup, uh, well, I can kind of talk through that because we've got the switch here. Uh, so batteries on, you'd fire up the APU uh, by throwing that guy on. Uh, APU will kind of fire it up, fire up on, its, on its own. Once the APU is cooking, uh, you'll get a green light here, uh, and then you'll go ahead and uh, crank the right motor. We normally start the right motor uh, just because that's got all of our essential hydraulics. Uh, so if something were to go wrong, we'd have you know good brake pressure and all that. Uh, so you'll go ahead and crank it, uh, and then you'll kind of get your eyes up here. Here. This is our EFD, uh, and that's going to show kind of basic engine uh, displays um, as well as uh, uh, some some fuel uh, quantities. Uh, so you go ahead and crank the right motor with that switch, like I said, and then you're going to get your eyes up there, and you're looking for 10 psi uh, and 10% uh, there, and you'll go ahead and put the click this throttle uh, up into idle. Uh, and then essentially from there, the jet will start itself. Uh, you're just kind of monitoring your displays and looking for certain limits uh, that you want to, the jet to kind of uh, stay in. Uh, so like I said, the jet's super easy to start. Uh, it pretty much starts itself from there. Cool, and then kind of the same process for, for starting the left, uh, left motor. Uh, you'll put the engine crank switch uh, over to left, and then again, just kind of watching your displays, get the throttles up to idle, uh, and, and uh, they're actually called the FADEC. Uh, which that's kind of the computer 
computer systems that prevent overspeeds. Um, you know, all, all the abnormal starts uh, that you would maybe see starting in older aircraft. Uh, the FADEC will essentially prevent all that stuff, uh, and it'll do an auto shutdown if something's out of whack. Uh, it's a pretty cool system. Uh, we kind of talked about the position lights when we were doing the walk around. So position lights here, you turn those knobs uh, up for brightness, and then the form lights, those green lights, uh, all the way up. Uh, this switch here is just your your standard strobe light, like any other aircraft, just a switch on or off. And then kind of hard to see on the outside of the throttle uh, is the master light switch. Uh, so all the way forward is going to be everything on. Uh, if you put it in the middle detent, that's just our NVG mode, so our night flying mode. Uh, and then all the way off is going to be, uh, or sorry, all the way aft will be off, uh, off with all the lights. Uh, cool. Moving forward. Uh, just fire loop tests here. That's what these are. We've got two systems, Alpha and Bravo. So you'll test those in the startup, making sure you're getting good indications in case we would actually have a fire. Uh, moving up here, landing taxi light uh, on off. Um, launch bar, so we kind of saw that uh, on the walk around. Uh, that's retract and extend. Uh, so when they give you the signal to extend on the boat, you put that down, the launch bar will come down. Flaps, uh, we've got half and full. Uh, those are our two settings for the flaps. And then around here, uh, this big yellow handle here, uh, you can see it's pinned up now. Uh, that is uh, the canopy jettison. Uh, so for some reason you were on the flight deck uh, and you need to egress out of the jet and ejection wasn't an option, uh, you go ahead and pull that and essentially it's going to launch uh, the canopy off the back of the jet. Um, so hopefully you never have to touch that thing. Uh, again here, this is our emergency uh, jettison button. Um, it's a, a, another kind of important button. You don't ever want to touch that uh, unless you need it. Uh, and if you do push that, essentially it's going to blow all of the, the stores off, uh, off those brews or whatever stations you're carrying essentially it's going to blow them off they've got some charges in them uh and usually for some reason you had to push that button um was most likely uh getting a, a soft uh cat catapult off the the front of an aircraft carrier and the jet's just slow so you need to get rid of weight uh, just to try to fly away uh, that's what that button does uh landing gear handle like i said cell jettison similar to the emergency jettison but now you can kind of selectively jettison if you have some kind of hung store uh a station that you know uh maybe like you're having some issues with and there's some weird asymmetry you need to get rid of them uh, you can go ahead and turn the dials uh, and then it's got we call these the chicklets essentially you pick what station uh, and then uh, essentially you can select what you want to get rid of off the off the aircraft uh, here right now you can't see them because the the jet's not on but this is going to be our our uh, landing gear and flap uh, indication. So you've obviously got your three green. Uh, so nose wheel, nose wheel, both mains there, uh, and then your flap settings here. Um, it'll basically be half or full, and then the other lights there for a caution. If for some reason you were to, uh, you know, you had some kind of flaps caution, uh, that's why the third one's there. Uh, moving up, uh, this is our master arm switch. Anytime we're employing any weapons, uh, obviously that guy's going to go into arm, uh, and then the jet's kind of ready to fire there. Uh, before I get to the fire extinguish light, uh, down here is just air to air uh, master mode and air to ground master mode. Uh, so you can push those push tiles uh, and it'll put the jet into those modes. Um, up here on the left and right, so this is our. Uh, fire button um, so for some reason we we're in flight um, we got a f engine fire uh, basically the procedure is going to go ahead and uh, lay, r raise this little flap here so if we had a fire on the right side you'd raise this push that in uh, and then you're getting your eyes over here uh, to the fire extinguisher right uh, you go ahead and have a discharge light, you push and hold that, and essentially it's going to uh, put the fire out in whatever motor you've got. Um, that's kind of the, the fire emergency procedures. Uh, obviously there's, there's some bold face, um, and when we say bold face, those are just memory items uh, for a lot of emergencies. Uh, so we've got about 18, they're always changing, new procedures are coming out, uh, but essentially those are just procedures that you have to memorize uh, just in case uh, that were to happen to you, you have to uh, you know, run through those procedures without pulling out a checklist. Uh, these are all of our displays here, uh, normal displays. This is kind of our situational awareness uh, display is what I call this. It's called the MPCD. Uh, that's the big display down here. Uh, basically, it's God's, uh, you know, a God's view of, of the battlefield or wherever you're at. Uh, and then these displays you'll use uh, constantly changing, um, whether you're, um, you know, navigation, if you're just flying around navigating, 
uh, or uh, if you're you know uh, running tactics you'll have those tactical uh, displays up uh, basically on the left and right we call these the DDI's uh, and then this is the UFCD this is how you're gonna turn all your uh, change your frequencies you've got uh, we've got two comms on this jet or sorry two radios on this jet uh, here's the switches for those uh, comm this is our pry radio it's got a little bit more power than this guy uh, but we usually uh, on our aux radio that's what we call the secondary radio or aux radio that's what we're going to be up uh, talking to our wingman uh, so we'll be up the same frequency there uh, we are UHF and VHF capable so we can talk to you know normal civilian um, uh, you know control centers uh, on, on Victor frequencies, uh, or we can use UHF, uh, which is a little nice for going on the road, a little less chatter. Uh, you don't have to listen to all the civilians. Uh, this, these displays down here, sorry, these knobs here are gonna uh, turn on the HUD, uh, which is here, heads up display, uh, pretty awesome. You see them now in like modern day sports cars, which is pretty wild. Um, and then here is gonna be our AOA indexer. Uh, so this guy is really the, the big thing when you're uh, configured and landing at the boat, you'll see all the indications, whether you're uh, on speed, fast or slow. Uh, and that's that's going to illuminate there. Uh, sweet. Down here, this is all our standby uh, stuff. So this is jet. This jet is equipped with with kind of the old steam gauges uh, that you're kind of used to, and and you know your your everyday Cessna. Uh, but there are some upgrades where we do have digital uh, backup displays in case we were to lose our primary displays. Um, so yep, we still still have these on board. Uh, Hopefully you don't have to use them. Uh, not fun flying that when you're used to all the digital stuff. Sweet, this is uh, how you arm and de-arm the seat. Obviously it's safe now, um, so you can read the word safe. Uh, wing fold switch, so yep, as you saw in the walk around, the, uh, the, wing f the wings are folded, so there's a uh, up is to fold, and the wings will just fold on its own, um, and then uh, all the way down for spread. Uh, if you need it. it has a hold function um, which essentially it'll just hold them where they're at uh, and the big thing is the wings will not be locked uh, so never really use the hold function um, you're, you're either gonna be fold or spread uh, cool hydraulic pressure so normally pressurized to about 3,000 pounds uh, and then once we get over uh, kind of in the high speed environment it'll go up to 5,000 pounds of pressure uh, and that's just to help those massive control surfaces uh, just deflect against uh, you know the wind uh, here's our hook uh, handle, uh, basically up or down. Um, no airspeed limits on it. Uh, you can drop it whenever. Just the just realize if the hook is down and you're going, you know, 500 knots, the snubber pressure just doesn't have enough pressure. So you'll get a hook light, and that's usually just means you're going too fast. Um, cool, have cool emergency switch. That's going to pop the beer can that we kind of talked about on the on the walk around. So uh, a couple emergencies that'll kind of run you through that. Um, usually those aren't good, especially if it's real hot out. You're most likely coming back uh, to a really hot cockpit. Uh, cool battery switch uh, in the middle, and then left and right uh, generator switches there. Um, then here's all our cabin, uh, sorry, cabin press uh, ECS. Uh, switches um, and then this is uh, the the important one this is our air conditioning knob uh, so once we get the motors online and the bleed airs uh, it's going to pull uh, pull uh, essentially air off the motor uh, and then put it through a cooling system and you can get cool air or hot air uh, on deck if it's really hot uh, we have a, basically a, a, a clear canopy so it never really gets super cool in here if it's hot outside uh, but once you get up to altitude uh, it's a pretty awesome air conditioning system uh, some anti-ice stuff we don't have a lot of capabilities like some airliners uh, do uh, with flying through ice so we just avoid ice you talk about this anti-ice uh, engine heat all that stuff bleed air that's gonna be on uh, we've got you can turn just the left on uh, or right on, so it's right off, left off. Uh, it's kind of confusing there, but if you want the right uh, to be off, uh, then you'd go to that side. You'd only do that if you had some kind of emergency or work and that a checklist uh, led you there. This is all our internal lighting here. Uh, so instrument panels, floodlights, consoles. We've got a little chart light that sits up on the, on the canopy. Um, so you can use that at night uh, when you're trying to read some charts or do a crossword puzzle. Uh, here's our radar, it's gonna turn that on. And this is our INS knob. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, plug in a good waypoint zero of where we're at on startup and then we'll go into ground and then essentially the jet will find the satellites uh, on its own uh, and get a good alignment. Once you got a good alignment, uh, good GPS, you're good to go. Uh, and then here we hadn't talked about the stick uh, right between the laps. Um, so 
Uh, cool on here. This is how you're going to pickle any uh, any air to surface ordnance, and then we've got the trigger on the front. Uh, the growler does not have uh, a gun, so no gun for us. Uh, but this will employ uh, air to air missiles, uh, the M120. And then down here, uh, this red button's our nose wheel steering, so high gain, low gain. Uh, and then we've got a trim knob here if you need to trim the jet. Uh, sweet, I think that's everything for the front seat. Uh, I'll go ahead and take you to the back seat, show you some of the differences, uh, what they got back there. All right, welcome to the back seat. Uh, as you can see, uh, primary thing they're missing is uh, controls. Um, so all the EA-10G uh, deployed growlers are all gonna have this configuration. Uh, the back seater is gonna be the electronic warfare officer, the EWO, uh, and they're uh, a naval flight officer is their designation. Uh, and essentially they've got these big uh, displays here uh, and they're basically gonna be the airfield, uh, the battlefield managers back here. And they're also gonna help with navigation um, and all the comms, uh, you know, standard stuff for, for basic flying around, uh, um, you know, here uh, over in America. Uh, but they're, they're basically gonna run all the weapon systems from the back. Uh, so the pilot's primary responsibility is to fly the airplane, um, get it to the right piece of sky, uh, employ uh, any weapons that they need to, uh, and then the, the EWO, the electronic warfare officer, is gonna back them up. Cool displays, they've got an EFD, just like the front seat. Um, and then here on, on the left and right hand side, uh, these are their, uh, their little controllers, kind of like a, a video game back here. These, these, all these buttons on here are basically uh, going to change these displays uh, and they're going to use these buttons to do that efficiently and quickly. Um, so I won't really go into that, but that's how, essentially how they're going to work all the weapon systems uh, with these two little joysticks in the back here. Uh, they also have an emergency jettison button. Um, cool, this strap you're seeing I didn't talk about in the front seat, that's what you're going to strap uh, yourself to the seat. We're sitting in a Martin Baker ejection seat. Um, so we're going to have eight uh, attachments. We're going to have lowers, uppers, your waist, uh, and then you'll have some next to your shoulders. Uh, it'll be eight total. Um, cool, and that's pretty much the back seat. Not a whole lot uh, different here. Uh, there's comm knobs, all that stuff, just like the front seat, just set up a little different. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much uh, the back seat.